What's up, everybody? I'm Ryan Thomas. Welcome to the Thomas Take Sports Podcast, hosted by myself and a guest co-host today, Eric Ellis, joining me today. Um, we are an hour and 20 minutes into the two-hour show, and today uh, we talked about a lot of sports topics. If you haven't tuned into those parts, tune in. Be on the Facebook page, uh, and they'll also be on YouTube at Thomas Take Sports Podcast, and, and on Facebook uh, at Thomas Take Sports Podcast as well. Um, Eric and I are from Buffalo, New York, um, and uh, we're avid Buffalo Bills fans. Um, yeah, I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> um, but we try to be as good uh, as sports fans as we can of, of the Buffalo Bills. Try to represent Buffalo as best as we can. And um, I felt it was my obligation to give my take on an article that was given or that was written uh, in the Buffalo News by longtime Buffalo Bills sports writer Jerry Sullivan. And Jerry, uh, before I start with that, you know, I want to preface my statements by saying Jerry has had a very successful career. He's written for the Buffalo News extensively over the better part of the last three decades has had hot takes constantly, and I know personally that when I post something on Facebook or when I write something in an article and not everybody agrees with it, it takes a lot of guts to write things and put it on paper and have people judge your opinion. It does take serious cojones to do that, knowing that there's a large population of people that might agree and might disagree with you. So Nowadays especially. Yeah, so Jerry, you know, Bravo to you for putting your opinion out, you know, whether I agree with it to a fully, you know, to a full extent, you know, five times out of ten, that's another story. <laughs> uh, but I want to give my reaction to your take on uh, Doug Whaley while I give my take and while Eric gives his take. So here we go. Jerry Sullivan wrote in the Buffalo News that it was uh, time for the Buffalo Bills to move on from Doug Whaley. We are... In the March month of the 2017 year. So that means that Buffalo will be drafting in a few weeks' time. Uh, unless they trade down, it'll be 10th overall in the 2017 NFL Draft. <laughs> Jerry Sullivan gave his full take on why Whaley should go, citing the millions of reasons that everyone already knows, frankly. <laughs> and that is kind of my position. Uh, Eric, you go with your position. You have the floor. Give me your take on uh, Jerry Sullivan's take on Doug Whaley possibly being fired. Sure, sure, yeah. So, you know, I I look at Jerry Sullivan. He's a great writer, you're right, um, in many ways. I, I don't always agree with his opinion, but in this article I read the Buffalo News today um, about his reasoning for why Doug Whaley should be let go. Um, you know, there's a lot of good cases for it. I actually will admit I was I was a fan of Doug Whaley when uh, he first started. I didn't see a lot of things that he was doing that were too um, su severe that would bring the organization back a couple of years um, yeah. from being back in the playoffs. Yeah. But um, you uh, you look over the drafts that Doug Whaley has had. Um, Doug Whaley, for those of you who don't know, was formerly a scout for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a guy who was part of a Super Bowl winning team, you kind of have an idea that you, you think this guy will be good. This guy will have an idea of what he knows what he's doing. Um, but throughout his entire drafts with the Buffalo Bills from 2013 to currently 2016, 2017 coming up, uh, <laughs> Doug Whaley hasn't really had a lot of success with the draft picks he's had. The first draft pick he was actually part of was E.J. Manuel, who is now the, uh, I would say, third-string quarterback at this rate uh, for yes. the Oakland Raiders. And that's, um, yeah, that's uh, definite. Yeah. yeah. and uh, <laughs> He's battling for the backup job. Exactly. Let's we'll just put it that way. And, and, you know, I don't really want to go through all the names, but, you know, I'll, I'll list some names that, you know, you probably may recognize but aren't on the Bills anymore. Yeah, list some names. Uh, Robert Woods. Uh, mm -hmm. Duke Williams, I think is is he still on the team? I'm pretty sure. Uh, he's not, but. Yeah, I think he is, but in he like is. a reserve role. Okay. Uh, Kiko Alonso. Uh, oh wow, <laughs> there's so many actually. Well, well rather, I mean, let's, rather uh, than let's not yeah, let dwell on that. Rather than yeah, rather than going through all the names, let's just say that you know the drafts 
used to be like when Bill Polian was the GM of the of the Buffalo Bills, the drafts were like twelve rounds, you know, even sixteen rounds. The drafts were way more in depth and involved than what they are now, and that is a good thing and it's a bad thing because. It was a good thing in the sense that when you drafted a player in the 80s, 70s, 90s, before pre-free agency era, you drafted that guy and he was your guy. Unless he wanted to play in the rinky-dink USFL like Jim Kelly did or Tom Cousineau or whoever. If you look at it now, you got seven picks to hit on these seven picks. And you know what? To be honest with you, this is part one of this segment. <laughs> it, there's going to be another part to this because it's too in depth for me to just talk about it one no, time. I agree. I agree. So uh, I just want to preface my statement by saying that. But um, you know, you have seven picks to hit on. You need three of those seven picks at least, three of them, to be hits for your team. If they're not, you are essentially screwed. And in every case, in every draft in which Doug Whaley has drafted, including 2013, in which people say that Buddy Nix drafted Doug Whaley, which I'm really at the end of my rope of hearing that, because what happened was Buddy Nix was the GM, Doug Whaley was the assistant GM. There's a term called the draft room, in which when E.J. Manuel was drafted, Buddy Nix was sitting in the chair and Doug Whaley was sitting right next to him. So if Buddy Nix knew that he was leaving, as did everyone else, as did Doug Whaley, you bet your ass Doug Whaley had some influence on that pick. And obviously, it became apparent to me that E.J. Manuel was Doug Whaley's boy when they decided to sit Tyrod Taylor for that Jets game and put in E.J. Manuel that final week of the season. That etched in stone that Doug Whaley wanted to see the last hurrah of E.J. Manuel would eventually ended up being the last hurrah. So it's very frustrating to me that this guy is still here. I don't want him here. I, I've made that you know really clear. My thing is with Jerry, if Jerry wants to write something about Doug Whaley, and it's 100% accurate, I agree with it. But as I said, Jerry Sullivan has been writing in the Buffalo News for 30 years. He's written articles that I could only dream of writing. Okay, that you know, that's I'll say that, but Jerry Jones should know the consensus around this area. Jerry this art, yeah, Jerry should know that this article should have been written four years ago. This article should have been written, eh, I won't say four, I'll say three years ago. When EJ Manuel got benched for Kyle Orton, this article should have been written, bla blasted. Put Doug Whaley on blast. And when Doug Marone quit, as much as I think Doug Marone is a coward and a quitter, when Doug Marone quit and it allowed Buffalo to have to hire another head coach, more blame should have been put on Doug Whaley. They went from Marone to Rex to now McDermott. And, and now they're saying that now they're saying that this is the coach, this is the coach that Doug Whaley got the chance to hire. Doug Whaley shouldn't get a chance to order someone a ham sandwich, let alone hire the next head coach for the Buffalo Bills, especially <laughs> when Terry Pagula bought this team. So if anybody's the boss, if anybody's hiring anybody, point the finger at him, and that's okay, because he actually owns the team. That's the one thing that I would not want Doug Whaley to be doing, but you is and hiring I, the coach. You and I both know that, all respect to Terry Pagula, he still got the Bills to stay here. He and Kim do not know what they're doing when it comes to football. They don't know how to draft a team. They don't know who should be in charge of personnel. Well, that's so. that's the that's the underlying issue is that, you know, it, it starts at the top, too. And they have to be willing to let him go. But, you know, they don't know. They don't have the contact list, being that they're new owners and they're babies in the league, that if they fired Doug Whaley, I don't even know what direction they would go in. I would want them to hire Sean McDermott as the GM. Give him full power of, of the team. That's at, fine by me. I at wouldn't this care. point in the offseason, yeah. it feels like he already is. That's true. I feel like uh, I would expect them to move towards uh, firing him. I feel like it's playoffs or bust for him this year, much like it was apparently for Rex. Mm -hmm. So, 
You know, you look at the drafts, the 2013 draft class, E.J. Manuel was literally the last casualty of that draft class. When they let go of E.J. Manuel, they have no more prospects from that draft. And in terms of all the guys that they brought in that have been just so bad, um, I would have hoped that they would be able to rectify this. What is your take on just the direction of the team? This is it's tough because you know Doug Whaley at the end of the year when Rex Ryan was fired, um, we had Anthony Lynn as the interim head coach, and there was no real like statement that was given about why you know Rex was fired. There was nothing that Doug Whaley did. Anthony Lynn was the one who gave the press conference as to what was going on, what the game plan was for the game against the New York Jets on Sunday. And, you know, everyone expected, you know, the GM to come out, speak on behalf of the owners if needed. He didn't. He didn't come out and do that. And then when the season ended, he decided to have this press conference to let everybody know he wasn't privy to the conversation. And it's ridiculous. You're the general manager. How are you not told that the head coach of your team is being fired? Or why were you not in the room? Exactly. And if he wasn't, yeah. if he wasn't in the room, if Terry didn't want him in the room for that conversation, if, if Terry didn't want him in the room with Rex Ryan when he fired Rex, why the hell is he the GM? If Terry couldn't even let him be in the room, I mean... It, as that Charles Trotter or whatever the guy's name was on ESPN, they're a dumpster fire. I, I hate to say it, but they continue to show that they are the last. The last thing they are is organized, which makes them a a not a finely tuned organization. And like when they had Ralph, when Ralph was obviously Ralph was old for like thirty years. No disrespect. But he, but he was, you know, he was not in good health at all. But when they had, when they were in the Super Bowls those four years, they had Ralph, Bill Polian, and Marv Levy. It was the little engine that became a giant engine. <laughs> so they could run through everyone through the AFC. They went to four Super Bowls in a row. They drafted Hall of Famers in the fourth and fifth round. They continued to just be complete monsters on the on the field. They were a dynasty that didn't win a championship. Seven. But they were still a dynasty. Seven. And now, the only thing that they're a dynasty of is not making the playoffs. That's And, and I don't expect them to this season. And they're putting Sean McDermott in such a bad position right out of the get-go. And the guy seems like a great guy. He's a, he great, he's a great coach. I don't understand why they would put this guy in. In this position, and I, I honestly, I feel sorry for him. I, I really do. I really do. But he's he's putting his own personnel in there. He's yeah, that's getting true. the guys he feels comfortable with. He's trying to get the he, he's trying to get some of the players he was coaching in Philly. Uh, not Philly, yeah. sorry. Uh, excuse me, uh, Carolina. Carolina. Well, yeah, and uh, Philly, too. Philly too. But, yeah, um, he's already got one with Lashawn McCoy. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, but you know, he's trying to get these guys together that he's comfortable with. And the another thing about Whaley that's a huge issue to me. Is that we've you discussed it that uh, he's had three coaches and you know he's not going along with any of them. No, it's it's Rex and you know they they brought in Rex. I was excited when they brought in Rex because it generated hype, but hype doesn't win games. No. and and the X's and O's are what's important, and they misfired. This is definitely not the last of this segment. We're gonna put this into part two. Uh, we're going to do a part two of this segment. Um, I want to ask uh, Eric a few Buffalo Bills questions. As I know, the large part of the fan base, so to speak, of this show is Buffalo Bills fans. And I thank you guys for tuning in uh, weekly when I put these episodes out. Uh, I really appreciate it. I got a shout-out to a few groups that I'm a part of on Facebook, Buffalo Stampede, Bills Fan Till I Die, uh, there's also a Buffalo Bills backers group based out of Jacksonville, Florida that I just joined. I did not know the ferociousness of these fans that are Bills fans in Florida. It's insane. Nationwide, man. So, Florida yeah, too. yeah it's, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be right back.